a select crowd today. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and uh, we're going to do something a little different today where we're uh, down 50% of our musicians here. So what we're going to do is we're going to do uh, requests out of the hymnal. Okay, so not everybody has to pick one. I've got one from Ben. He would like to do softly and tenderly. And I have one from Mrs. Ivy, C Cindy. <laughs> And uh, she would like to do Victory in Jesus. Uh, so uh, I'm going to give you guys a couple of minutes to try and think about if there's anything else that you would like to do. Um, and in the meantime, we are going to have announcements from Melissa. Thank you. Very good. So go ahead and take your hymnals and start looking because there's like 12 of us here. So we need um, half of you at least <laughs> to give us a song. <laughs> But this is just a good, fun sing-along. We're not karaoke like we did for, uh, for, Chris <laughs> for Christmas Eve, I mean, for Christmas party, which was a lot of fun. Um, but we actually have Denise and Gina leading us. So that is definitely a blessing. So, um, so right now is the opportunity to take out those hymnals. If there's not one in front of you, there's, there's definitely one in the row in front of you, even if it's not right in front of you. So feel free to, to get up and and move and, um, and find those hymnals. <clears throat> so we just welcome those of you that um, did get up and get here this morning um, as we just celebrate our new year together. So just reminder, your offering as you walk in, um, as you walk out the door or in the door. And um, we're blessed, blessed to have um, our wonderful fill-in pastor here this morning um, and also half of our musicians. So very happy to have Denise and Gina leading us this morning. So let me just read scripture to you. It says, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18 says, our temporary minor problems are producing an eternal stockpile of glory for us that is beyond all comparison. We don't focus on things that can be seen, but on things that cannot be seen. The things which can be seen don't last. But the things that can be that cannot be seen are eternal, and that Second Corinthians four seventeen. So just be blessed this morning as we worship together um, and listen to God's word together. So for those of you that just walked in, we're doing a um, request music Sunday morning. So grab a hymnal and find a song that you would like to sing, <laughs> and we're going to have that open for request. Okay. Okay, so I'm hoping that you're going to sing really loud, okay? <laughs> All right, let's start off with uh, Softly and Tenderly, page 337. Let's do verses 1 and 4. <laughs>
page 352, and it is victory in Jesus, and let's do verses 1 and 3 on that one as well, 352. Uh, Y'all must be up. song they'd like to sing. 256. Let's 256 because he lives verses 1 and 3, please.
one more. <laughs> I need somebody to come. <laughs> Page 85. Page 85, Amazing Grace. Got to have you guys stand. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, Jane's going to have to give me just a minute here. I am. Uh, Well, it was battered and scarred, and the auction it felt it was hardly worth the while to waste much time on the old violin. But he held it up with a smile. I know it's not much, but it's all we got left. I guess we ought to sell it too. Now who start the bid on this old violin? Just one more and we'll be through. Then he called out, who give me one dollar? Who make it two? Only two dollars, who make it three? Three dollars twice, now that's a good price. But who's got a bid for me? Raise up your hand and don't wait any longer. The auction's about to end. Who's got four? Just one dollar more to bid on this old fire.
For the air was hot and the people stood around as the sun was setting low. From the back of the crowd, a gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow. He wiped the dust from the old violin and he tightened up the strings. And then he played out a melody pure and sweet, sweeter than the angels sing. And when the music stopped, the auctioneer, in a voice that was quiet and low, said, now what am I bid for this old violin? And he held it up with a bow. And then he called out, who give me one thousand? Who make it two? Only two thousand. Who make it three? Three thousand twice, now that's a good price, but who's got a bit for me? And the people cried out, what made this change? We don't understand. And the auctioneer stopped and said with a smile, it was the touch of the master's hand. You know there's many a man whose life's out of tune, who's battered and scarred with sin. And he's auctioned cheap to a thankless world, much like that old violin. Oh, but when the master comes, that old foolish crowd, they never understand. Oh, the worth of a soul for the change that is wrought by just one touch of the master's hand. Who give me one thousand? Who make it two? Only two thousand. Who make it three? Three thousand twice. Now that's a good price. But who's got a bid for me? Raise a few grand. We don't understand how this could ever be. And the auctioneer stopped and he said with a smile, it was the touch of the master's hand. It was the touch of the master's hand. It was the touch of the master's hand. Yes, the touch of the master's hand. Amen. Amen. Good. Thank you, Denise. Well, it's good to be with you, and uh, the Lord is here this morning, so that's great. Uh, I suppose you all enjoyed uh, your Christmas, and now we're into a new year. Have you ever got a present at Christmas that you really didn't like? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, you just kind of smiled or set it aside, and that was it. 
Well, my uh, family, we, when our got, kids got older, we finally decided that we wouldn't get the kids anything because they were married and had grandchildren, but we would spend our time with the grandchildren and the presents. And uh, we decided we'd only give maybe 5 or $10 just as a little token appreciation for the others. And so I was at Lowe's one day, and I, I saw this hat back then that had a little button here that you pushed three different times, and it had a different brightness to each one of those uh, bulbs that were in that um, hat. So I bought it for my son-in-law, and I could still see him as he opens it up, looks at it, and kind of sets it aside, you know, like, what's this? <laughs> but my grandson, Alex, I love that kid. <laughs> he said, hey, Dad, look at this. He began to push the buttons. He said, this could be very useful. He said, you know, when we go to Guatemala, they run out of electricity in the early evening and it's dark. You could use this thing. My son-in-law began to smile and said, hey, that's right. And so I was thinking about uh, the gifts that we get at Christmas. Do we set them aside or do we use them every day? of our life. Well, I'd like to share with you this morning four gifts that are useful that we received at Christmas. Now, the, the first one is Elizabeth gives us the gift of rejoicing. I'll tell you why Elizabeth is rejoicing. In Luke chapter 1, it, it talks about uh, the G angel Gabriel coming to her husband, Zechariah, and especially uh, tells him that he's going to have a sin, he's going to have a son. And so Zechariah is like some of us. You know, we, we're old enough, we know when the biological clock just runs out. And some things are just not possible, and so we know what we know. And so he said, no, that's not going to happen. And if you notice in verse 19, the angel answered, I am Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God, and I've been sent to speak to you to tell you the good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their proper time. So Elizabeth becomes pregnant after a clock runs out. And she has a sense of rejoicing about God promises things, they happen, folks. And so I don't know what God has promised you or what he will promise you this year, but sometime at the proper time, God will bring that about to you. And as I was thinking uh, about that, uh, God's promise of rejoicing she says, nothing is impossible with God. With man, we can't do some things. We just say it's impossible, but not with God. Nothing is impossible with God. And as you know, as she gives us that first gift, she reminds us that Weeping may endure for a season, but joy cometh in the morning. And it wasn't long afterwards we see the second gift of Mary coming to us 
offering us a gift of the Christ child. While Elizabeth had so kind of focused in on God keeping his promises, and with God, nothing was impossible. So as soon as she sees Mary coming, she says in herself, she didn't have to ask her if she was pregnant. She knew that she was carrying the Messiah. And as a result, she said, my soul, it just magnifies the Lord. In a sense, uh, she, she was saying, even the baby that's in my womb, who is now six months old in my womb, has leaped for joy because God has promised a Messiah and the Messiah has come. And the Messiah is not going away. He's going to reign forever and forever. I say glory to God. Now, as I think about uh, Mary, one of the things that I think that is so important besides the Christ child is you'll find in verses 20 through 38, she is saying, God, I am the Lord's servant. Hmm. Right? I am the Lord's servant. Be it unto me all of what you have said. What your word speaks to me, I'm for it. Whatever your will is, I relinquish my will to your will so that you can have honor and glory. Well, you notice something about Mary. She's no high society girl. She's a little peasant girl. But God uses the insignificant. Isn't it amazing? God uses us, insignificant people, to do extraordinary things. You know where Mary came from? That hick town of Nazareth. What good thing can come out of Nazareth? I'll tell you who could come out of Nazareth. The Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal King, the Messiah, the Lord of Lords. He who reigns on the throne of David. He who is for everlasting unto everlasting. Who is sitting now at the right hand of God. That's who comes. I think about, well, he... He goes to Bethlehem, and there he's born. He didn't stay at the, you know, the upstage uh, hotel. But he was born in a manger. And he didn't have silk pajamas or a silk cloth. He was wrapped in swaddling clothes. But I want you to notice that God uses the insignificant. But also, I want you to notice that a lot of my friends, they kind of plagiarize. I don't know if that's quite the word, but they kind of seem to paint a real dark picture about all the things that Mary had to go through. I don't think Mary had to go through any dark picture. I think when God does what God does, God covers all of the bases. He came to Mary and an angel of the Lord spoke to her with a greeting. And in that greeting, she said, I don't understand why you're calling me favored. And then he begins to tell her that she will conceive. She said, well, I'm not arguing with you. Be it unto, I'm the Lord's servant. Whatever you say, just tell me the progress or the process. And so he begins to tell her that the Holy Spirit will come upon her and that 
she will carry the Messiah. Now, a lot of people try to make that picture real dark about her going home and trying to convince her mother that she didn't have sex with some boy. I, don't, I think when God covers a basis, he covers all of them. He had to go to Joseph in a dream. And in that dream, he showed Joseph, this is my will. I want you to be the father of my child, in a sense, of the earthly father, even though you're not the biological father. You see, when God gave another dream that they will go to Bethlehem to be born, that the afterwards that the king was trying to kill all the two-year-old babies, he warned Joseph in a dream that take the child and his mother and protect them and get them out of town. I want you to know that when God does what God does, he covers every last situation to the glory of his name. He doesn't just do things to cause trouble. God provides answer after answer after answer. And then I think about the, the third point is revealing God's love. Well, as you look here to God's love, you see it very clearly in the Garden of Eden. You see that God loved his creation. <laughs> he still does. Are you one of God's creation? Does that bring a little hope to you? <laughs> And so he told Adam and Eve that you could eat of every tree except the tree in the garden of good and evil. Well, Satan seduced them. And as soon as they sunk their teeth into that forbidden fruit, believe me, they knew evil. And they knew sin. And they tried to cover themselves. God comes back looking for Adam and says, Adam, where art thou? Do you think God didn't know where Adam was? <laughs> God knew exactly where Adam was. God always knows where we are. He knew that Adam was in sin. And when we're in sin, God knows where we are. Now, let me ask you a question. Because of that sin, that evil couldn't stay at the garden, there was a separation from them. And as, as a result, there was a big distance between God and and man. Well, let me ask you a question. Did God still love Adam and Eve? You better believe God loved Adam and Eve. If God didn't love Adam and Eve, he would never would have sent Jesus. Do you think that Cain, who killed his brother, do you think God loved Cain? Yes. God stood in Cain's face and said, Cain, anger is crouching at the door, but don't give in to it. You know, tough love is a good thing in our life. Sin is crouching at your door. Do deal with it. I'm here to help you. And so you go down through the ages and you come to the point, did God love Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? You better believe he did. Before that, did he love Noah? Yes, spared his family. Did he love Abraham, who passed his wife off as his beautiful sister? <laughs> you think that he loved Jacob, the old heel grasper and the deceiver? Did he love him? You better believe he did. 
Otherwise, he never would have sent Jesus. On and on we could go down through all the prophets. They all had quirks like you and I do. And that God still loved them and he used them in significant people in ways beyond our comprehension. And so we come to John 3.16, the revelation of God's love. Now, I suppose everybody here knows John 3.16, right? You ever notice how we quote John 3.16 about as fast as we can? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, and whosoever believeth on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Well, hallelujah. <laughs> you know, that is some way of knowing something, but not really doing it. How many of you know Queen Elizabeth? She was a queen. Reigned from the early 50s. All the way up to just last year. We know her husband. We know her children. We know all about her. But have we ever been at the castle? Have we ever had a conversation with her? No. We know about her, but we really don't know her. But God in his revelation wants us to really know him. So let's make John 3.16 personal. You got to help me this morning, okay? God so loved the world. Well, isn't that nice? What about me? Well, maybe I ought to put my name in there. Let's try it. God so loved Dan Wheelock that he sent his only begotten son. That whosoever, hmm, whosoever. Remember, did we used to sing that old song, whosoever meaneth me? Any of you remember that? Yep. Well, then maybe I ought to put my name in there. God so loved Dan Wheelock that he sent his only begotten son, that if Dan Wheelock would believe, ooh, believe on him. That word believe is in the Greek word pistos, meaning there's no English word that is adequately, adequately uh, available for, um, what do you want to say, translating it. So it means more than mere intellectual accent. It means somewhat of an a emotion as well as a sense of trust. So it's saying that whosoever believeth on him means that person who has both mind and soul and spirit and emotion in it, trust him in such a way that they could have everlasting life. So let's go back and try it, all right? God so loved Dan Wheelock that he sent his only begotten son, that if Dan Wheelock would completely Believe with his heart and his mind and his being. Dan should not perish, but Dan would have everlasting life, right? Go ahead and put your name in there now. Let's try it. We'll do it slowly, okay? God so loved Dan Wheelock that he gave his only begotten son that Dan Wheelock would trust in him with his mind and his soul and his spirit, that Dan, on Jesus Christ, that Dan Wheelock would not perish, but that Dan Wheelock would have everlasting life. 
That's God's love. Make it personal. It'll work. And then as we come to that, we come to the greatest gift of all is the gift of Jesus, the fourth sign. Why did Jesus come? I'll tell you why. Every rotten thing Satan devised, implemented, got away with everything it seemed like. Jesus came to reverse everything Satan did to try to defy God's authority. God, through Jesus Christ, sent the record straight, folks. <laughs> I tell you, it is a wonderful thing that God, through Jesus, in the plan of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, is reversing everything Satan has tried to accomplish. The word atonement. The word atonement means back at one with God. Do you know all the benefits of God? No, I don't either. But one thing I do know is that I am back into the Father's love and relationship with him. That is one of the most meaningful things in my life and in my spirit. And it will be with me forever and forever. Glory to God. Now that word atonement, there's also the word justification. Justification means... Just as if I had never sinned. You see, the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed me from all that Satan has put within me. Jesus has taken it out and has cleansed me and has flung my sin as far as the east is from the west, buried in the deep sea of God's forgetfulness, never to be remembered against me no more. Just as if I'd never sinned. <laughs> oh, I want to tell you, folks, that's rich. Then I think of adoption. Adoption means uh, it's a legal term. I belong to one family, but now I belong to another. <laughs> I tell you, I love my new family. <laughs> I love the family of God. Oh, how wonderful they are. Oh, they have faults. <laughs> they're a little twisted. They're a little odd. But they're my brothers and they're my sisters. And they put up with me. <laughs> and together we are joint heirs with Jesus. <laughs> Everything Jesus has, we have. You know, my daughter has two boys, and she wanted a third child, and she thought, oh boy, it'd be my luck to have three boys. And my son-in-law was adopted by a Nazarene family that took him in and helped him and taught him to love Jesus he wouldn't be at the place he is today spiritually if it hadn't been for that Nazarene family. And so they adopted a little girl from Guatemala. And you know what? She's entitled as much as those two boys. <laughs> That's how much you're entitled to, folks. You're entitled to everything that Jesus has. And he has plenty for you to share. He has given us regeneration. Something old has passed away. Something new and vibrant has come in. Now, some of us old guys, when mechanically a little bit inclined, knew what a generator was on a car. Now it's an alternator. But it produced 
new life to our battery. I don't know what the new car, electric cars are going to be, but they've got to have some source of regeneration. And you and I need some source of regeneration. We just can't have what we had yesterday. We've got to have something new in our heart and in our life. And God has the regenerate power. That's why Jesus has sent the Holy Spirit into our lives to keep us alive, keep us focused, keep us feeling that we are God's creation, that we are justified, we are, are adopted, that we have this newness of life coming into us. One of the best ways I can tell you about the Holy Spirit is the last part is that he is either resident or president. You see, when you are saved, the Holy Spirit comes in to your heart and life. He's the regenerator. He generates good things, good thoughts, good feelings, good truths, good promises, good everything. And so it is that he resides. But I want to tell you today, probably the most important is he can either be resident or he can be president. And when he presides, folks, you will have a life that's worth living because of him. So we have these gifts. What do you say this year? Let's rejoice. Because <laughs> God's going to keep his promises. He always has. He always will. Let's relinquish our life as Mary did. I am the Lord's servant. Be it unto me accordingly to what you have said. And then... Don't ever forget God keeps on revealing and revealing and revealing his love, and it's personal. And Jesus, he's working on us. <laughs> he's reversing some things. Oh, he probably won't reverse everything till we get to heaven. <laughs> but what he is doing is tremendous. What we cannot do with God, it's possible. And so let's enjoy the gifts that we have been given and let's use them for the year of 2023. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Would you stand for our closing hymn this morning? It's on the screen, or if you'd like to follow in your hymnal, it's on page 486, I Surrender All.
benediction this morning. May the Lord be gracious unto thee. May his face shine upon you. May you experience the intimacy of the Savior's. May you enjoy the Father's love. And may you enjoy the newness of of the Holy Spirit as he works creatively in your life. And all God's people said, amen.